shine down on me. Hello friends, I'm Chad Coffin, welcoming you to the River Church Telecast with Pastor Dale Berry. I'll be back at the end of this broadcast to bring you more information on the River Church. And now, here is Pastor Dale Berry. Well, open up your Bible with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, and Matthew's Gospel, chapter 28, two places. This morning, I want to talk to you about putting the go in the gospel. Hallelujah. How many of you know the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, isn't it? It's the good news. And unless somebody has that good news, guess what? There's no news. Amen. And, uh, you know, frankly, without good news, there's no news at all, as far as I'm concerned. And the gospel is the good news, the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, at a time when uh, a lot of churches are still shut down, haven't reopened, and uh, <clears throat> I think in many ways we've lost sight of what we're supposed to be doing on the planet. So what we'd like to do is restore a little go to our history and our heritage while launching uh, out forward today. Amen? Hallelujah. So today we want to implement the activity that puts the go in the gospel. Amen. The go in the gospel is everything from doing the work to going into all the world with the gospel. It's everything that's active that confirms you believe the Bible. Amen? It's not just witnessing to your neighbor. However, it's, that's part of it, isn't it? Hallelujah. There is the come unto me of the gospel too. How many of you know that's true? You come to him, uh, he'll deal with all that ails you, won't he? Come unto me, all you that labor. And uh, he said, I'll give you rest. Amen. So there's always going to be the come unto me. But it's always going to be equipping you to go into all the world, isn't it? Amen. A lot of people in our cities have established, or in our circles, have established coming to me, but not all have established going to all the world. You know, church is known for being a place, a harbor, a resting place, a refueling station, amen? And how many of you know that's what it should be, amen? But the purpose of that is to equip us to go into all the world, amen? So in the process of in just enjoying God, somebody else is supposed to enjoy God as a result of our enjoyment, amen? So it's supposed to touch others. What we're getting from God is supposed to touch others. I don't believe, I believe there's a balance. I don't believe you're supposed to wear out and die touching somebody. No, you're supposed to go back to the fueling station very often. Amen. You're supposed to always be receiving from God. Amen. But you're not going to be a balanced Christian if you're not sharing what you're getting with someone else. Isn't that right? Amen. Come unto me is first. Going to all the world is second. So we know we had to come to the Lord first, didn't we? But we also know once we did, he said, go into all the world, didn't he? Mark's Gospel, chapter number 16. Let's, re let's begin right here in verse number 15, okay? And he said unto them, go ye into all the world. Somebody say go. I looked that up in the Greek, man. I studied that in depth in the Greek. And you know what I found out it means? It means go, don't it? Amen. Couldn't twist it, couldn't change it, couldn't turn it, couldn't slow it down. It had go in it. Just go, 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 go. Amen. It's filled with go, praise God. And preach the gospel to every creature. And so when you, when you add the preach part and every creature part, man, we got a job to do. And as Brother Dave shared during communion this morning, uh, Jesus is coming again. And I can't help but believe it soon. What about you? Amen. Amen. If I'm going opposite direction east, I'm looking over my shoulder. <laughs> Amen. Because I, I believe he could come at any minute. Amen. And I believe a lot of people won't be prepared, but I believe people that are coming unto him and going into all the world are going to get a little connect, a contact, a little voicemail or a text or something. Don't you? We're going to get an impl implication that he's coming because we know in our knower it has to be soon. But in the meantime, we're going to keep coming to him. We're going to keep going to all the world. Amen. What are we going to do? We're going to occupy till Jesus comes. And part of our occupying is going to all the world. We don't occupy just because we gathered some real estate. We occupy because the kingdom of God is established. Isn't that right? Amen. And, uh, you know, I was thinking uh, yesterday about that scripture. Uh, another thing you have to consider uh, when you talk about uh, the family of God 
uh, like the scripture, I, I really love the scripture in Second Timothy, or the First Timothy 2, where it t- says that we're to pray for those in authority. It says for kings and all that are in authority. We have to consider when this book was written, it was an Eastern book, not a Western book. And it was written, uh, and it was put together at a time where kings and kingdoms were the main operation. Isn't that right? So basically, if the king wants it a certain way, guess what? The whole kingdom's going that way, isn't it? The whole kingdom's in line with the king. And the last thing you want to be is not in line with the king if you're part of the kingdom. Isn't that right? Well, we're in the kingdom too. Amen? And we want to be in line with the king. But in dealing with nations, we're not dealing quite the same. You can't just pray for the president because we're in a system in our, in our uh, little world right here in the West, we're in a system that is in, it's got what they call balance of power. We have a judicial, we have, we have the Congress, we have the Senate, we have the judges, and then we have a president. And all those things are coming together to try to keep a balance, right? Well, guess what? It's not just having a president that will go with God. I think we found that out more recent days, don't you? It's about having, in our situation, we can't just pray for the president. We've got to pray for the other branches of power. We gotta, we've got to pray, and not only pray, we've got to put the go in our gospel and be involved in influencing those branches of power. Well, just let politics be politics and let the church be the church. Listen, if you let politics be politics without the church, it'll take us all to hell in a handbasket. It's all going down, amen? So we have to raise up people in our churches with that in mind. We have to be raising up uh, disciples in our churches with going in mind, not just politically, but all over the world. And, and uh, one of the greatest ways to affect the gospel going to all the world from the West is making sure that the operation of the West is intact. We've got as big an assignment politically as we do spiritual because the spiritual is part of the political. Amen? Amen. And we've seen in the last four or five years that when people want to go with God consistently and a group want to go, they get things done. But if, they, if it's the other way around, it, it hinders things, doesn't it? So we see in Mark 16, he said to them, Go in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, and they shall and lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now we know nowhere in the Bible does it stress that we're to handle snakes, period. So all people that are handling snakes religiously, ceremonially for church, are in error. It's heresy. It's not biblical. The only example we, we have in Scripture where I, where I found is where the serpent lashed his hands on Paul's arm and he slung it back into the fire. Come out of the fire, so he slung it back into the fire. So it's not biblical to handle snakes. Matter of fact, what's your first reaction when you see a snake? Yeah, either kill it or run, right? One of the two. Get, get rid of it before it gets rid of you, right? If you don't know much about snakes. Um, I had a great big one in my yard once and I attacked it because I didn't know what it was, you know. I attacked it and killed it. I, I didn't realize it was just a chicken snake, sorry. <laughs> if you're part of the snake family. <laughs> Killed one of your relatives. So sorry. Well, I, you know, I just didn't know what it was. Uh, I, didn't know my, I didn't know my snakes. But uh, what I can verify for you is the signs that follow them that believe in my name, there's still such a thing as casting out devils. There still is. People have demon problems. Have you noticed that people, now we categorize it in, in the Western civilization, we'll say, oh, they're losing their mind. Well, if you can get the devil off of them, they might have their mind back, might be in their right mind. And, and frankly, if you, can, if you can get the devil off of them, you can get them healed too if it's just a biological problem. And I, frankly, I, I give the root cause of every sickness or every disease or every mental problem uh, to the devil. He's the one authors every bit of that. You say, well, he's not, it's not always a demon. Sometimes it's a physical ailment. It's still birthed from hell. And if there hadn't been a fall, if there hadn't been a human fall, there wouldn't be any sickness. So we've got to go back to the root and blame the root. And many times I think the devil just gets by with a whole lot because we don't, you know. Uh, and and the, one of the biggest things about the goal of the gospel, uh, this is about the goal of the gospel, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, or unto thou art also called. 1 Timothy 6.12, I believe it is. 
fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on what rightfully belongs to you. So we're supposed to be aggressively pursuing what is rightfully ours and aggressively resisting what's not supposed to be attacking us. James 4, 7 says, Submit your God, yourself to God, therefore resist the devil. And what will he do? He'll flee. So we have to put the go back in this. It's not about just going to church and getting fed. No, if you're here today getting fed, it's to equip you for how you're going to go. Amen. So all this week you're going to be going and you're going to be coming back and receiving and going and coming back. Not just here, but at home. You should be spending time with God at home. Amen. But all I get time I get with God is Sunday morning. Well, you're not getting very much. The best diet on the planet on Sunday morning is not enough for a believer that's going into all the world and preaching the gospel. Isn't that right? He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they'll cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll speak with new tongues. Somebody said new tongues. The baptism of the Holy Ghost did not cease with the original 12. Read your Bible. Amen. Read your Bible. Matter of fact, Acts chapter 1 verse number 8 says, You'll receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. How are you going to be a witness? You know what a witness is? One that provides evidence. How are you going to prove that Jesus is alive? Just like he did before he went on high, after he rose from the dead. He spent some time on the planet after that, and he, was, uh, he, he, he proved he was alive by, the Bible says, many infallible proofs. In other words, signs, wonders, and miracles was the proof that Jesus was alive. Nobody would have accepted just the fact that, hey, I saw Jesus walking down the road today. Well, how, you're crazy, he's dead. Well, he wasn't. And so he went doing many infallible proofs. Well, the reason the church, the people don't know the church is alive today because there's not many proof. There's not much proof. There's not a lot of proof that the church is alive. And, and if the church don't prove that you're alive because he's alive, then guess what? Nobody really believes he's alive. And that's why nobody misses the church when it's shut down. Amen. You got to say, oh, me or amen, don't you, on that one? Amen. Well, how are we going to change that, Pastor Dale? We're going to change it by each one of us demonstrating the power of God and demonstrating the goal in the gospel. Amen. The goal in the gospel is not just did you reach all your neighbors this week. However, you might do one thing that's an act of love for one neighbor. You might pray for the sickness of another neighbor. You might cast the devil out of another neighbor. There may be a harvest field right where you live, okay? And you can't love your neighbor as yourself and not give them what you've got. Ooh, that's hot off the press. Amen. You can't love your neighbor if you don't know your neighbor. You're going to have to go out of your way to meet your neighbors. Well, I don't really like my neighbors. Well, just find an act of love. Find some things you can do that's Christian. Amen. Just start the ball rolling. Amen. Sow a seed. Amen. They shall speak with new tongues. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is alive and well. Acts chapter 2. Did you throw the book of Acts away? Well, but Pastor, I was raised Baptist. So was I. So what? I was raised Baptist. I got my start with Jesus in the Baptist church. Does that take something away from God or add something to God? Doesn't mean he'll be. Baptist churches, there's Baptist churches that preach the, preach the baptism in the Holy Ghost with evidence of speaking in other tongues. And there's a whole bunch that don't. Well, you know, I'm not mad at the Baptist church. If it wasn't a Baptist church, I wouldn't have got saved with a... Uh, Probably, I mean, I might have, but I got saved in a Baptist church, and it was, it was a dramatic experience in the power of God. The awareness of the lost condition was unbelievable. The awareness of the need for a Savior was, I mean, peaked really high. And so when I got saved that day, I knew I was saved, nine years old. Thank God for the Baptist church. Don't reject the Baptist church because they don't believe like you believe. Take what you've got and give it away. Amen. Get your Baptist friends filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Well, how am I going to do that, Pastor Dell? Listen, most of them, if they don't know, if they hadn't seen you demonstrate and you grew up with them in a Baptist church, they think you're still Baptist. And you are. You just got filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. It's okay to identify with John the Baptist, isn't it? That's all right to identify with John the Baptist. Just take the power that he took, amen? And they shall take up serpents. To me, that what that means, if you'll read all of the scripture, that means we should tread on the enemy. 
We should tread on all the power of the enemy. If you'll see, if you'll read the Bible, you'll see it's established that, that the devil's under your feet. So the go in the gospel is an aggressive faith life, which is not, not just knocking on every door. No, it's everywhere you go. It's everywhere you go, affecting somebody, touching somebody, planning on the reason you woke up today was to rejoice in the Lord always. Today, again, and again I say rejoice, and touch somebody else with the power of God. Amen. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. I can't tell you, who knows how many times you've drank something that should have harmed you and you didn't even know it, but you were standing in faith so it didn't hurt you. You know what I mean? Amen. That's what that's designed for. It's not designed to go out and drink, drink poison to prove that God exists. Don't tempt the Lord. We're going to be seeing you in heaven if you start doing that. We don't need that. You need to finish your course. Don't be that ignorant. Amen. It says, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. I know that's awkward to some people. Well, I grew up in a Baptist church and we didn't do that. Well, you grew up in a Baptist church, it makes no difference. If you're reading the Bible right now, you can start doing what the Bible says and it makes no difference whether you're Baptist or Pentecostal or Presbyterian or what. And people are starting to see that. People are starting to see that. Do you know some of the denominational churches have got some of the best contemporary worship now that we've ever seen? They're getting it. They're seeing it. They're seeing that worship is universal language. Amen? And they're going to see, if they don't already, that the Bible's the Word of God. And so if the Bible says it, I can believe it, and that should settle it. No matter where I come from, my background comes from. Matter of fact, if I'm from the Baptist church or the Presbyterian church or the Methodist church, the Methodist church has this in their roots with John Wesley. So if you're a Methodist and you don't plan on leaving because God put you there, resurrect the doctrine. Amen. Add some, uh, some message to your method. Nothing, a Methodist church is great people. My father-in-law and, and, uh, and his wife are in the Methodist church. My wife started out in the United Methodist Church. Well, there's some of you out there that are Methodists that believe in the power of God. Take the power of God to your church. Don't, you don't have to leave your church unless God's telling you to. If you're in the Baptist church, take the gospel, the good news of the gospel, the go that's in the gospel. Go into all the world, preach the gospel. If you're going to go from that place to the world, you're going to have to take this Bible with you. You're going to have to take it to the place you're coming to the Lord to receive and so that you can go from there with something to go with. Amen. The days of Baptist, Methodist, those days are pretty much over anyway. All that stuff now is labeled for structure only. Most of them are taking it off the, the street signs. We've got Pentecostal and Baptist churches here that if it's uh, Park West, it don't go by Park West of what denomination anymore. It goes by Park West Church, you know. If it's, uh, if it's West Knoxville Church and it was West Knoxville denomination title, it, they're, they're changing it to West Knoxville Church because they're putting emphasis on the real church. So that is changing. So don't get caught up in, in such a, uh, a thing that makes the power of, go no, of no effect. Through tradition, okay? Don't be bound by tradition. Let the power of God flow. Amen? Amen. Matthew 28, starting with verse 18 now. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore. Somebody say go. And teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded to you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. How many of you know <clears throat> that as you go, you can simply just live out what you've learned and what you're walking in in front of people and help people get there? You say, I'm, I've been afraid to talk to people about getting saved. Just go talk to them about Jesus and all that he does for you. If you read the Bible at all, the Lord will bring to your remembrance. And you can study a few scriptures, but you can go, I promise. Just go and share your faith with people. Why do you love Jesus? What has he done for you? Does anybody in here have Jesus do anything for him? Amen. Why? You love him for that reason, I bet, don't you? Well, huh? You love him because he's saved. Well, that's enough to go with the gospel right there. That's enough to go in the gospel right there. In our Matthew text, we can see that they were with him, they were with him already when he said go. They were with him being equipped with the go. So Jesus spent a lot of time with his, his disciples, didn't he? E equipping them. Did they get everything down pat before they went? No. There wasn't time to do that. They were going to keep coming back and fellowshipping with the Lord 
and going into all the world, right? That's the pattern we see in the Word. And so that's our pattern, amen? Note, they will continue to fellowship with the Lord to draw, go energy, so they would be strengthened for the go, amen? So we know that coming to me is first, going to all the world is second. We also know that repeating this, this process, coming to me again is third, going to all the world is next, again, is next. So we're going to always be coming back to the Lord all week long, we're going to always be going out the door, looking on the fields that are white all ready to harvest. Now, I didn't say people were ready to hear the Bible said it. Amen. Uh, people just don't want to hear the gospel right now. Who said? <laughs> Who said they don't? That's the lie you bought. Amen. That's what you were talked into believing. Amen. What is the go in the gospel? L look on the fields. John 4, 35, and let me read Amplified Classic, okay? Do you not say it is still four months, or, yeah, do you not say it is yet still four months and the harvest time comes? Look, I tell you, raise your eyes and observe the fields and see how they are already white for harvesting. Now, let's just stop right here just a minute. The reason we don't see the opportunities is because that's not how we've aligned our day. That's not how we've aligned our life. The reason we don't realize that, heart, that people are ready to hear is we're busy talking to them about everything else but Jesus. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? We've got on our mind what we've got to do today. You don't have anything within your job or family or anything that you have to do today that shouldn't have Jesus infiltrating it totally. If Jesus is not swallowing up what you've got to do, I'm not saying you don't have to do those things. Well, Pastor, I've got to make a living. You got to take somebody to heaven. If you don't, you don't make a living very long if you're a believer. I'm telling you, the blessing of the Lord is upon being a fully balanced Christian. It's upon the whole package, amen? So he said, look, with observation, you have to every day, the same way we're learning, that rejoicing is a part of every day. This is the day. The day you wake up, a lot of things happen every day. His mercies happen every day. His mercies are renewed every morning, right? What's something else that, ha that happens every day? Let everything that woke up and realized it had breath, praise the Lord. Praise you the Lord. Praising the Lord happens every day. But how many Christians don't praise the Lord every day? Praise the Lord when something good happens. That might be once a month because they don't ever praise him daily. Not much happens for them. Amen. Amen. Sometimes somebody, they'll praise the Lord when something bad's going on because they realize it's a weapon that will stop the enemy. So they'll praise, put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaven. Sort of, frankly, no believer should be depressed. Yeah, but it's biological, Pastor. Well, you just praise God like I'm talking to you about. Let's see how biology changes. And I'm not, I, I'm not saying there's not some biological things that pull people down. I'm not suggesting that. What I'm suggesting is even if the first time you praise God, heaviness ain't gone, it's still the root cause. The devil's still the root of the problem. Irregardless, and just like Brother Hagin ministered that message that time on the praise cure, no matter why that problem is there, even if that's the way you were born with that and, and biologically there's a problem, it will still change through praise. It's a promise of God. Amen. So if you run, you run upon a depressed believer, you need to teach them this. Well, you know, Pastor Dale, you know, it'll hurt their feelings. Well, listen, their feelings are really hurt right now being depressed. They're really hurt. If you can pull them out, praise God with them. You know what I'm saying? Help them. Help them get there. Or praise God in their behalf and lay hands on them. You see what I'm saying? If you're not bound by that same thing, you can help somebody out of it. Isn't that right? So look with observation. One of the things during the times we live in, I don't think anybody in this room or watching me by Facebook Live or any social media or on television right now, I don't think anybody watching me wonders if Jesus is coming soon or if it's late in the game. I think everybody believes that. Don't you? Then how is it possible that people don't need to receive and aren't ready to receive right now? Listen, the world has been served notice that it's late. Even the unsaved believe it's coming to the end. So if you'll go out of here looking with observation and be prepared to give a reason for the hope that's in you. Nobody's got hope right now. The harvest field is better than it's ever been because people need hope. How do you get up every day and go on right now with all that's going on in the earth? 
faith in Jesus, right? You've got hope. You might realize how far apart you are from people around you, but you are very much separated because you have a reason to hope in the future. Most people that all they know is what's going on in the earth right now, they don't have much reason for hope. Amen. Amen. Amen or oh me. So I just, I want to stay there for a minute. Even if that's the last thing I get done today. You know, we got to look with observation. And I'm giving you some things right now that will cause you to observe. How's it like this? Even in your meditation, how is it that I have some hope but a lot of people I'm coming in contact with right now really don't have much hope. Well, they've been told, pretty much they've been told they're going to die from a virus. Ain't that about how it's been said? <laughs> pretty much. You know, even though the percentage of people that have died is about the same as the flu, we're seeing they're coming up with more numbers now. Even though it's, even though it's about the same, we're not saying it's not real. But because of the way they proceeded in delivering it, nobody can say anything hardly. Because if you say something, the one person I know that passed away from this, you're inconsiderate and you're insensitive. And so everybody's ready to stone you. But you know, it's a funny thing. It's how it was packaged. You know, we don't expect somebody usually to die from the flu. If somebody around you gets the flu, you know that they feel really bad, and they need some nurturing, they need some help, but most of them, you expect them to recover, kind of. I'm not saying nobody dies from the flu, they do, but most of us, when we know a family member's got the flu, we've not already just thrown our hands up and said they're going to die. Although, the way the, the, the virus was packaged, there's an expectancy that they're going to die and a hope that they won't. I'm telling you. Thank you for tuning in today on the River Church program. We hope you can join us soon in one of our services. The River Church meets every Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. and every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. We are located at 6716 Central Avenue Pike at Callahan Drive in Knoxville, Tennessee. On behalf of Pastor Dale Berry and the River Church, I'm Chad Coffin. Wow.